by um, the very kind of necessary framework you gave us um, about thinking about and starting at with 1619 um, and then hearing these testimonies and bringing it all together for folks. Um, yeah, so I'll hand it off to you from here to the end. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, I just want to thank the panelists uh, for, you know, the inspiration and offering the testimonies and also the work uh, with Border Angels and Detention Resistance. Um, it's vital, as Oscar said, you know, the the work of organizations, um, uh, abolitionist organizations is vital in this context. Uh, so, but, and also, but the leadership of those who have endured these experiences is also vitally important. Uh, not only not only leadership in terms of offering testimony, but you know, Oscar Oscar has a book coming out. I mean, I mentioned some of the books that I hope all of y'all have an opportunity to read earlier. Um, and I would just, as a first kind of starting question, I don't I don't have a lot. I think it would just be good to have an an open conversation if possible. But one of the things that I saw as a connecting link between what Oscar and Hennessy had to offer was, you know, this issue of being, um, you know, kind of commodified. Um, you know, Hennessy, so I thought it was really interesting your point about the actions that are labeled criminal uh, by the state uh, in terms of migrants are actually para sobrevivir, like the actions of survival. Um, so I was thinking, you know, one thing that we could start off with is just maybe hearing more from you, Hennessy, about what that means, particularly for you, and and also the the compas on the inside, who also were criminalized for behaviors that are predictable, given the structure of racism, of capitalism, of homotransphobia that you were talking about earlier. I hope somebody can kind of get the gist of that to, to Hennessy's. Um, um, Alex, do you want to do it or I can do it as well? Uh, if you can, could you just like simplify the question? Because it was like Yes. I um, tried already, but I'll try again. <laughs> <laughs> so the Hennessy's talked about being criminalized for acts of survival. And I, I think that that is something that really connects the struggles of people criminalized on in, in all the communities we've been talking about. So if she could just expand more on that aspect, either from her own personal experience or from those who were incarcerated with her. Okay. I uh, can also do it, Alex, if you'd okay. like. Okay, sure. Um, Genesis, um, el, um, Dennis está preguntando que si puedes um, compartir más sobre el, el comentario que hiciste de que como te pusieron el label de que tú eras líder de esos como movilizaciones de las huelgas de hambre que pasaron um, de cómo como esos um, esos actos eran um, actos que se comprende que gente hiciera en esas condiciones um, él dice que si puedes como hablar más sobre de eso de que tú y tus compañeros y compañeras um, como hicieron que y lo que es como sobrevivir, sobrevivir entre esas condiciones. Ok, pues cómo sobrevivir. Pues yo creo que el cómo sobrevivir entre todos, pues fue, fue muy, es difícil sobrevivir allá adentro. Este, de verdad, a mí me pusieron como líder porque nadie hacía nada, nadie tomaba cartas en el asunto de cómo, por qué no estábamos contagiados, por qué no nos hacían caso, por qué nos, nos veían por la ventana solamente oficiales, este, oficiales, managers, este, oficiales de migración, como se acercaban. Entonces, a mí no me gustó eso, como nos, como nos aventaban la comida. Y entonces, por eso decidí hablar con varios compañeros para que, como yo no puedo hablar inglés, este, que me prestaran su voz para decir que ya era uno hasta aquí. Y de hecho, tengo hasta pruebas donde este, me están este, esposando cuando hicimos huelga de hambre. 
y ya estaban a punto de, de, este, de echarnos gas lacrimógeno para callarnos en, en el momento y ya no hacer escándalo. Cuando yo me meto a hablar con la manager para decirle lo que estaba pasando, pues le comento todo porque pues ella se iba a dormir a su casa y ya pues llegaba el siguiente día, no se ha dado cuenta. Cuando yo le, cuando al siguiente día que yo llegué, yo, yo, yo hablé con ella y le dije todo lo que pasaba y pues ya habíamos este, organizado desde la noche para no agarrar la comida que nos daban en la, en la, en la mañana. Y en la, pasó eso en la mañana, en la tarde igual, este, ya no quisimos agarrar la comida, pero en la tarde fue cuando me agarraron porque yo era la líder, porque yo me había metido con a hablar con Torres, con la manager, y pues eso fue de que nos pusimos huelga de hambre y se, se pasó la voz, eh, como en los platos de comida, les, pos, les poníamos a los compañeros en una hoja, en una libreta, este, que, no, que no agarraran la comida, que, que la dejaran, ¿verdad? Para que nos hicieran caso y no quedar callados en esto. Alexis. Gracias. Creo que Alex va a traducir. Okay. So, uh, Genesis says that it's very difficult to survive inside, that she was uh, the targeted leader because nobody else was doing anything and nobody was taking any action. Uh, so, the officers would look at them through the window and um like the managers like the the immigration officers and everyone and she didn't like how they would just throw the food at them uh, so she decided to organize with uh, other compas uh, because she doesn't speak any english so that way uh, she could borrow their voices um, and she also says how she has a proof of how she was being handcuffed uh, because of doing the hunger strike And uh, she spoke with the manager Torres and said everything that was going on. And uh, at that point, she spoke with her uh, like one day. And during that day at night, they were organizing already not to take the food the next morning. Uh, and yeah, so uh, that's when she was sent to solitary confinement when she was organizing for the hunger strike. So they didn't take any food for breakfast and they also didn't take any food for for lunch in the evening um so that's when she got sent to solitary confinement and uh, they were organizing uh like whenever they would they would the the food the plates they would uh, write on papers not to take them for other compas to know that they were doing a hunger strike Thank you. Should we go on from there? Uh, thank you for that, Hennessy and Alex. Um, the It's just interesting because right now there is a compa in Palestine doing a hunger strike near death. I mean, I haven't kept up with this case today, uh, but it's, you know, as, as we keep talking about la, la lucha es nuestra and it's a comunidad en la lucha. Um, Hennessy, your words are really important to us uh, to set, tell us about the hunger strike. I also want to remind everyone about the hunger strike that took place in California fighting against conditions of solitary confinement in both 2011 and 2013. Uh, the second one included over 30,000 prisoners uh, in hunger strike, uh, again, fighting against conditions of permanent solitary confinement. And I guess just a, as a second question, and then I, I would like to have it more free flowing if possible. Um, so that, she, you know, Hennessy's talked about, you know, the process of surviving inside, but then what I thought I heard her say also was that the, the conditions leading up to one's detention or imprisonment are also about a process of, of a, just simply trying to survive. But then you have those demonizing labels of criminal gang member And we can see it in the lexicon and the words, the same words being used against all of our communities uh, in, the, in a kind of, you know, machine-like fashion, the, the branding of people as, you know, kind of in a comic book way as quote unquote bad people, 
as a way to rationalize what Oscar talked about as a, a conditions where people are being, you know, the, the places are being designed to break people. So it's it's also a criminalization of survival on the outside of fuera antes, antes uh, el carso or la carso, perdón. Um, so maybe Oscar, if you want to pick up from there, like the the process of being criminalized for acts that are out of our control and also that are real evidence of the criminality of the corporations of the state itself and of the legal system that leads one to be in a situation, you know, that you and Carlos uh, Escobar Mejia, uh, you know, ha was basically killed in, in, in my, in our estimation. Okay, well, good evening to everybody once again. Thank you. I'm probably going to turn the camera off because the mic goes out. So when speaking about this, something comes to mind that is basically everything from the very beginning when once you get put into detention, um, you do not receive what you would call what what is humane treatment. Um, my circumstances in my actual situation and how I ended up, um, I actually got deported in 2010 for a, for a crime I committed in 2005, which I ended up doing a prison time for. Um, I got deported to Mexico. I went through, I had three, three main incidents while I was over there where my life were put in danger. The last one being in May of 2019, where I was um, kidnapped, pistol whipped, had ribs broken. I was tased, I was zip tied, taken to a security house where I seen um, some of the worst atrocities that that a human can can commit on another human being. Um, things that have left me with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I have to take medication for all of that. It's not really easy to talk about, but it's I feel that it's healing for me. Um, all of that that I had to go through and actually the way that I crossed into the United States was that I swam across the border on August 2nd at three o'clock in the morning um, I stripped myself down to my boxers and, um, because of the situation I was in, my life was in danger. And I, I swam about 400 meters into the ocean on the playas de Tijuana side. And I made it, I swam for like an hour before border patrol actually saw me. Um, I made it about an hour into this side. And then the waves were so big that I had to kind of swim closer to, to the edge of the beach because the water was dragging me further in. La marea me estaba jalando pa dentro. So when I did that, one of the agents saw me on the floor, on the ATVs where they patrol the beach. I was I was then apprehended and, and I was given the opportunity to go back. They told me, go back to your side. We don't want you here, basically. Um, when that happened, I told them I cannot go back. Um, my life is in danger. Um, I wouldn't have swam across in this manner if it wasn't. They, they then, and so to tell me that basically <clears throat> he asked me, how did I know English? I told him I had been deported. He said, you know, you could face reentry time. And I told him at that point, like, that's a risk I'm willing to take. You know, my life is in danger and please take me. Now, once I'm taken into the icebox at Imperial Beach, one of the first things that happened to me was, was all of this that, I'm, that I was going through, coupled with the fact that I had just swam in the ocean for an hour and I got pulled out of the water. And now I'm get, I get taken to this ice box where I'm given this little paper thin blanket and the, the room is ice cold. They give you one of those little white jumpsuits to um, be in a cell with like 30 other individuals where you sleep on the floor. They pull me out and to do an interview, an interviewing officer pulls me out and he asked me to he asked me, are you, are you afraid to go back to Mexico? But he, he yells it. He doesn't ask me in a, like in a private one-on-one -on -one interview manner. He yells it so loud so that everybody else in there can hear. So I felt humiliated. I felt scared. I felt, I felt just a, a rush of emotions that I can't really describe right now because I, it, it's very overwhelming. I just felt like, how can he be acting this way when when basically he's saying, I don't believe you. When basically he's saying, okay, um, why would I swim across the ocean at three o'clock in the morning and just my boxers if this wasn't real fear? Why would I, when given the chance to go back and being told that you could face going to prison for years for reentry, still not go back for a real fear? And he, 
he kind of made a joke about it. He's yelling my my personal business out so that everybody can hear. I felt humiliated. I felt dehumanized. I felt I felt less than than a person at that point. Um, I, I refused to answer him in that manner. I told him, I don't think that this is something you should ask me this way, sir. I said, can, so he's, he put on the piece of paper, he lied and, and put on my, on my interview that I had said no. So when going through my proceedings, <clears throat> I jumped forward a little bit, <clears throat> getting to, to the detention center at Otay Mesa. So many things that were so wrong that I had to endure in there. Um, the thing with Carlos Escobar Mejia was that at, finally, after three weeks of being sick and so many of us telling, telling the guards, telling the medical staff, everybody that he was sick, finally, when he couldn't get up off of his bunk and he had thrown up on the floor and in his trash can and he couldn't move and he was shivering under a blanket inside of his cell and we let the guard know, they finally decided to move him out. When they did move him out, they did the, the worst thing that you could do in that situation. I mean, this is an individual who is over 50 years old. This is an individual who has underlying medical conditions. He had diabetes. He had to take insulin on a daily basis. He had part of his foot amputated. Instead of taking him to the doctor, which is what any human being would have done, they took him to medical and then they took him to L pod, which was the pod next door to us, Lima pod, where all the COVID 19 positive sick individuals were housed further exposing him in his weakened state so they basically that's like when that's like back in the concentration camps when you're forced to live with sick people so that you can contract the virus on purpose so that it can lead to your death i'm i'm in contact with his sister um with senor escobar's sister all the time when this happened i decided to write that letter because See, today I'm not that same person that committed that crime in 2005, 15 years ago. Even though ICE, even though immigration continues to look, look at individuals that way because they judge you based on what they see on a piece of paper. Today I just I just do things I just do things the way they're supposed to be done, and I and I don't harm people, and I just do what's correct. Um, so when I saw this, I I just felt that I had to speak up on it. I wrote a letter. We had 46 detainees, whoever wanted to sign it, sign it, and we sent it out. They're using it, I believe, in, in a lawsuit that's going on against the Otay Mesa Detention Center. And it's just incredible what these places do. I remember when the whole COVID-19 pandemic began and they told us that another pod was moving in with us. Um, they gave us two options. They said, everybody from your pod has to move to one side of the unit. And either you do that, they came in in full riot gear as if we were prisoners and we had been caught with doing something totally like if we were criminals, basically. They came in in full riot gear and they said, you have two options, move to the cells on that side of the tier or we're gonna take you to the hole, right? So in a lot of those cells that were empty that we had to move to were people that had been moved out of our unit already because they were COVID-19 um, positive and they had not been cleaned. So you're forced to be in move there. They put two units together. There's no social distancing. They cut your, your tier time or program time in half. Um, and another thing they did when they brought us masks, they did not want to give us masks. So I called detention resistance when this happened. Everybody started signing. They brought a waiver basically saying, for you to get this mask, you have to sign this waiver saying that if you get sick and you die from COVID-19, we're not responsible for you. There's so many people in our unit who did not speak English, who do not and a lot of people who just flat out did not read the paper and started signing it so they could get the mask. I read the paper, me and another fellow detainee of mine, and we were like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? They're basically saying we wash our hands clean if, if, you, if you were to get sick and die. So, so when that happened, when that happened, um, I let everybody know and everybody at that point went back and turned the mask in and told them that they wanted the paper back and everybody ripped up that piece of paper. Um, I sent a copy of that also to detention resistance so that they could know what was going on. Um, the book was written basically another big misconception about um, detention resistance, uh, something that uh, Senor Dennis Child said, um, my respects to you, sir. I think that what you shared is amazing. I think your voice, um, your, your point of view on all of this is amazing. And I feel so privileged to be able to share on this same platform as you. Um, people think that detention is just Mexican people or people of Hispanic descent. 
But in this book, there are people of, I believe, 12 different countries. I was in there with people from Saudi Arabia. I was in there. There was a kid in there from Saudi Arabia who his visa had expired. He was taking his he was taking his final exam at the San Diego University of Architecture. And they went in and pulled him out during his final exam. He asked them, I've been going to school for five years. Can you please at least let, at least let me finish my examination so that I can get my so that I can pass? They, they did not afford him that that opportunity. They took him in. He ended up getting deported. I think it's um it's so wrong, everything that goes on. There's people in there from Samoa, Saudi Arabia, India, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, Philippines, Ukraine, um, Venezuela, Argentina, Peru. All of these people are in that book because we wanted to give all of these people a voice and we want people to know the truth about what it is to be in a place like this because it's not really detention. It's more like like a concentration camp. And um, yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to, you know, in the interest of time, I, I think that's a really good note to, you know, move towards the, I guess we're going towards the close. You said it's like a concentration camp and it reminds me, I'll say the word, the name George Jackson again for everyone. There's a book called Soul Dad Brother that I recommend everybody read, where he, you know, refers to the the black radical concept or reality that the prisons represent a concentration camp technique, um, and that comes out of a history of settler colonialism against the Aboriginal Indigenous peoples of this land. You know, we someone said it earlier. We're on Kumeyaay land as we speak. Those of us who are in San Diego, Tijuana, right now. And, you know, just flipping the script on the narrative. I mean, what you gave us there is exactly what they don't want. They is the reason why prisoners, form prisoners don't ever get the microphone. You know, as the all of us are none folks say all the time, it's always people speaking for us and about us and us not having the opportunity to speak for ourselves. So, you know, I, I think that, and another part that I just wanted to touch on briefly is that in Oscar's comments, you know, he talked about a transformation from whatever it was that originally led to the deportation or what have you. And I want to remind everybody that, you know, Obama was called the deporter in chief by migrant justice folks for good reason, deporting 2.5 million people while he was in office. Um, so that that concept of that a reality of familial separation under his watch as well. Also, the 34,000 person quota that requires on every single day of every calendar year. This was passed by Congress un, Cong in Congress under his watch. 34,000 people required to be in the private and public facilities, um, migrant folks incarcerated every single day. So this is a structural situation and not episodic. It's not the, the production of one lunatic um, in, off in the office. Um, it is a production of a lunatic system um, in a, in a, and, a, and that, that, that's actually not really good language. I, you know, I feel bad about that because, um, you know, those that are differently able try to tell us not to metaphorize their, their experience of having dealing with mental dis, disability or what have you, but it is a system of state terrorism and corporate terrorism that we're dealing with here that has, again, its origins in these other systems. And I would just say again, you know, the Oscar's point about something quote unquote unquote that he did early on that that should also make us think about not privileging only the category of innocence as we do this work i think there's a way in which human rights organizations prison so-called prison reform organizations uh liberal organizations you know that are trying to do good work oftentimes fall prey to this notion that the only people we're saving are those that we can prove their innocence you know, you have things like the Innocence Project doing great work, but a lot of the movies you see about the prison system, you know, whether it be Shawshank Redemption or Hurricane, they parlay this notion that the people that we need to save and protect and keep in touch with are the only the ones who are innocent of what they're charged with. And I would just flip the script on that and say, how can a country that has committed genocidal acts all over the planet, including here. It is doing that right now by proxy in Palestine, doing that in Iraq, doing that in Afghanistan, 
doing that all over someone in our breakout mission on Honduras and Hillary Clinton overwatching the coup that led to not only the situation of people having to migrate, but the, the murder of people like Berta Casares there. How can a country that is responsible for more deaths than any other country on the planet talk have any moral authority to accuse a person, a, a young person of color or a person dealing with the worst of circumstances in life of any crime? So flipping the script on that kind of language is very important as we move forward. Um, so that's all I have right now. I'll turn it over to Alexis. Thank you so much, um, Dennis. Um, thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Genesis. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Ruth. Um, thank you, Isa. Um, and also thank you to um, everyone who is here attending in conversation with us. Thank you to Detention Resistance and Freedom All um, Coalition, and specifically the, pol the Political Ed Committee who um, organized this event. Um, all of your labor is appreciated and so necessary to do that work of what Dennis is reminding us, um, that work of undoing those ideological kind of representations um, and that work of bridging um, the struggles between um, prison abolitionism, um, ending mass incarceration with migrant justice, um, a conversation that I think we're barely even opening up here today. But um, yeah, thank you to everyone. Um, the last announcement before we go is that there is a, a meeting on November 9th um, for anyone that is interested in organizing um, for an action on November 14th. Um, there will be an action. Um, if someone can share that in the chat, that would be great. Again, I know it was shared earlier, um, but you can also follow us at Freedom All SD. Um, and you can follow Detention Resistance at Resist Detention or Detention Resistance on Instagram. Um, and yeah, um, I think that uh, concludes for the evening. Um, I hope you all have a good night. Thank you, good night. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Thank you, everyone.